All right, it is now two minutes past noon. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for the OCRAP, Blackwater Remediation Policies, Technologies, and Products. Again, my name is Brett Little, and I am the Executive Director here at the Alliance for Environmental Sustainability. Um, we're an organization that's been around for nearly 15 years, um, serving to educate the market on um, green building um, strategies, practices, uh, technologies, um, and mostly focusing in the uh, residential new homes and construction uh, area. We have been the Midwest premier lead for homes provider uh, since 2005. We want to thank our um, Platinum Plus sponsor for the next three years, um, Anderson Windows and Doors, um, for helping support uh, green building education uh, across the Midwest. And just give you guys a little bit of uh, upcoming events here before we get started that you might be interested in getting involved in. Um, implementing Lead for Homes on your next project. We have a um, four two-hour live webinar series coming up this summer. Uh, and if you go to our website to the uh, education link, um, you can actually click on a survey and put in your best time. Um, this is a you focused course, so you put in the best times that you're interested in joining. And uh, the, the survey, the one that has the best times, we will select that one as our course time for the next four weeks starting in the week of July 16th. If you're not interested in investing heavily into a four, eight hour course, we've got a one hour free webinar series on which to use, uh, multifamily mixed-use mid-rise versus lead NC, when to use it. We've got Jason LaFleur, our education director out of Chicago, teaching that course as another free webinar coming up next week, same time, uh, same place, uh, June 4th. This is going to be a fun one. Uh, Matt Grokoff and the Mission Zero Home, America's oldest net positive home remodel. How did they do it? Come find out on September 10th. Mark your calendars. You can sign up now. It's right on our website. Um, free webinar. And last, we're really excited to be partnering with Jay Hall, the lead lead for homes reviewer, to teach a fall-based um, September through October um, one hour a week um, session on understanding lead before for homes, how to implement that rating system, and proactively um, get involved in that um, before it becomes the um, key lead rating system of 2015. You can get a little more involved with us, become a member, sponsor, volunteer, intern, and check out all of our free on-demand recorded webinars, which is exactly this where this webinar will be uh, next week. If you're not able to catch it all or you want to share it, it will be available um, to send out to uh, right on our continuing education page. So I'm very excited here to introduce um, Atara, uh, coming to you from uh, Pittsburgh, um, Pennsylvania. And um, she is the project coordinator with uh, Rosie's Natural Way. Um, she's going to be lending us her expertise, knowledge, and experience um, on Blackwater remediation strategies, policies, um, technologies, processes here in the next hour. Um, Really excited. We uh, I was able to uh, meet Atara through a particular living building and lead for homes project that's happening on um, the other side of the state in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Really neat project. Really excited to see it come along, but certainly fairly intense with everything that they're doing. So it could be a ways out. But uh, I was able to make a connection with her there through that, and ever since then she's been fantastic in helping us out and lending us um, information on ways we can achieve um, you know black water remediation. Uh, strategies um, in, in homes uh, and, and multifamily housing. Um, one really neat thing to know about, um, about Rosie's Natural Way is that uh, uh, one of their uh, products the, um, has, been, uh, has been declared. Uh, and so what declare is, is it's a, uh, basically a, it's, a, it's a tool for understanding what materials go into um, certain products. And that helps with red list compliance and helps the market understand what products um, meet this. It's not a third party test by any means. It's a voluntary uh, label um, that an organization uh, decides that it's important to them to put information on. So it's really cool to see that Rosie's Natural Way has taken that step um, with some of their products. And so we're just excited to get the word out about that. 
And lastly, uh, many of you are here to uh, for continuing education. This is AIA, HSW, um, GBCI, uh, Nari Green approved for one continuing education hour. And excitingly, this is our first ever uh, Living Future accredited approved course. Um, at the end of the course, we will send you out a little 10 question quiz. Um, upon completing that quiz and getting an 80%, you will be sent to your certificate for continuing education. So with that, I will hand it over to Atara to take you through the rest of this. Um, as with most of these series, if this is your first time joining us, um, please put all of your questions into the meeting chat, and I will be monitoring them there. And I will either um, uh, let Atara know as they come up to have her answer them or hold them off to the end. Uh, there isn't any um, voice in this, so please just put your questions or comments uh, right into the chat box, and if we can't get to all of them, I will definitely um, be sending you all um, Atara's contact information. So thanks again for joining us, Atara. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Brett. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. My name is Atara Jaffe, and uh, I want to thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I am the representative, like Brett said, for Rosie's Natural Way, and we are distributors of sustainable and alternative solutions for conventional fixtures and wastewater treatment systems. Um, so my presentation today is titled, Oh Crap, Blackwater Remediation Technologies, Products, and Policies. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the problems that we have with our conventional infrastructure. Um, then I'm going to be moving on to the happier topic of how we can solve these, solution, uh, these problems with um, emerging technologies. And at the end, I'm going to have time for some questions. So like Brett said, if you have a question that comes up, if, uh, if it's more of a pressing matter, um, I'll have Brett interrupt me and I can, I can uh, answer it then. If not, if you could hold off till the end, that would be great. And I will be happy to answer any questions at that point. So let's start with the problem. So our first uh, obstacle in uh, the whole sanitation um, atmosphere is our psychology about it, our thoughts. Americans tend to think very strangely about our toilets. In fact, many of us have toilets and we have septic systems, but we don't necessarily know how they work or where our waste ends up. And a lot of people tend to just flush and forget. Uh, and also, we tend to turn our nose up to any kind of bathroom conversation, um, any kind of bathroom talk is generally regarded as inappropriate. Also, um, new technology can be a little bit intimidating on the, on the toilet end. Uh, they tend to have a different look, a different feel. Sometimes they need to be used a little bit differently. And in our bathrooms, it tends to be easier to stick with what we know. After all, it took us quite some time to get potty trained, and now we would have to learn something different. So. Okay, water. Um, so as some of you may know, our Earth is made up of 80% water. 3% of that accounts for fresh water. And only about 0.03% of that accounts for potable water, which is water that is acceptable for human consumption. Now, in our toilets, in the older models, which are thankfully beginning to be phased out, we use about 3 to 5 gallons per flush. If you think about that on a milk jug level, that's uh, quite a lot of water. On an average household in the U.S. of four, we use about 400 to 600 gallons of water per day. 27% of that would be toilet usage. And if you want to do the math, there's about 319 million people in the U.S. It's a lot of water that we're flushing away. Um, and just so you know that in your toilets, Potable water, like I uh, explained a little bit before, is acceptable for human consumption. And potable water is the only water that flows into our pipe systems, um, and that includes our toilets. So we're flushing drinkable water down the toilet. Water pollution. Uh, human waste is heavy in three main elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, also known as NPK. Um, when we excrete, we're heavily in these uh, elements. I believe the ratio is 11 nitrogen to 1 phosphorus to 1.5 potassium. And these elements are absolutely wonderful for soils and for plant growth. 
However, they are incredibly detrimental to waterways and cause a process called eutrophication, also known as algal blooms, which um, increase phytoplankton, which is a um, microscopic aquatic organism, and the explosion of these phytoplankton uh, communities decrease oxygen levels, which cause death in fish and aquatic plant life population. Um, this causes dead zones, and as you can see on the photos that I posted here, kind of looks like everything is, is wiped out. Um, another problem we have with water pollution is combined sewage overflow. So when we have heavy storms, water infiltrates, I'm sure many of you have seen, you know, flooding water, uh, that generally goes into your sewage sewer system, and they tend to overload in uh, when it heavily rains. And in some cases, wastewater facilities and our sewer systems alone are not able to handle the water amount, and uh, raw sewage can be directly poured into these waterways, again, causing this issue of uh, eutrophication. Infrastructure. Um, so what our built infrastructure looks like today, it's our conventional systems that we use. We have our sewer lines. There are millions and millions of sewer lines that run underground all over the U.S., mostly in cities, but in many towns as well. Um, and basically, again, like I talked with the combined sewer, sewer overflow, that's kind of the main issue that we have with there. But in addition, sewer lines were built uh, around, you know, 150 to 100 to 50 years ago. And at that time, they were built for the population size at that point. And our population has grown considerably since then. So a lot of these sewer systems are unable to handle, handle the amount of uh, sewage that we are putting into them. Again, that is also a problem of combined sewer overflow and is a big cause to sewer breakage. Um, the next part of our infrastructure is wastewater treatment systems, and that's the next step to your sewer line plant, where it goes undergoes about three different stages, uh, a primary treatment, secondary treatment, and tertiary treatment, which basically is a removal of that uh, solid material. And also the last point of that is a chlorination, where you disinfect uh, any water and that gets discharged into our waterways, but a lot of times chlorination does not take care of our nutrient problems, those NPK. Uh, septic systems is more for rural areas and that is basically you get a tank size depending on your local code, local building code, and after that is a leach field. And depending on your soil type, um, generally leach fields are great and they're sized and engineered uh, to a specific home, but depending on your soil type, leach fields can become flooded. Sometimes they pour wastewater onto lawns, create puddles, and if you are near a watershed, um, this can cause larger problems because you're, again, leaching all of this nutrient-heavy water and infected water into a waterway. This is a giant problem in Long Island, New York, and Cape Cod, Massachusetts, where actually they are making taking steps towards um, reducing that nutrient so the, uh, those areas don't deal with such uh, large algal bloom problems. So some regulatory infrastructure information. Um, it's pretty interesting. It's heavily leveled because uh, this issue of sanitation deals with not just, you know, your Department of Health. It also deals with your utilities department because water comes into play. And it also deals with your building code. So international plumbing code um, comes into play with plumbing where there are certain regulations against what can or cannot be done. Department of Health has uh, specific rules, but again, this is something that varies depending on your local uh, municipality. So there's no right answer, and I can't unfortunately give you kind of a say all because it varies from municipality to municipality. And again, the same thing with the utilities department. It, it varies. So the codes and um, regulations differ from place to place. Some economic information. Um, the cost of sewer lines, sewer maintenance, sewer construction are very heavy. Uh, maintenance on a, on a city level can cost to $3,000 per person to maintenance a system. Uh, the use costage is also very high. In fact, in Boston, it costs $6.23 to buy 1,000 gallons of water, but it costs $8.07 to discharge 1,000 gallons of water. That's about 25% more to 
discharge your wastewater as it is to buy water. Um, and new construction can be millions and millions of dollars, and that is put on your taxes. In terms of septic systems, those are also can be very costly. Um, pumping can be $500. Drainage failures can be up to $10,000. And a new construction of an entirely new septic system, if you're building a new house, could be upwards of $40,000. And that's not even including uh, the permits and approvals and the process to go through uh, gaining all of that. In terms of energy usage of our conventional systems, uh, it could be fairly high. Actually, 4% uh, of our total electric consumption comes from wastewater treatment facilities. And that's about a 100 billion kilowatt hours, which is considerable amount. Sewer pumping is energy, um, energy needy. So is transportation for septic pumping and maintenance. Um, this all requires heavy amounts of energy and fossil fuels to, uh, to perform. And lastly, soil is another one of our issues that we come into with our uh, conventional infrastructure. Um, some of you may know, but we have uh, some, some large issues when it comes to soil. Um, mining, which is uh, something that's done widely around the world, uh, we mine heavily for phosphorus, again, one of those nutrients that's in our waste, to create uh, fertilizer for agricultural fields. And this actually causes um, radioactive, acidic, processed water. And uh, this is highly hazardous, causes a lot of issues. This is a big issue, actually, in Florida, costing about $200 million in damages. Um, soil depletion, our, our farming uh, culture is such that you know, we have a high demand for food, so in that we tax our, our lands. There's a lot of over-farming, a lot of over-grazing because we love our meat. Um, but what that does is it depletes our soil and basically lends our soil to erosion. So uh, the first so layer of your soil is, is very nutritious, but if that becomes exposed, it can be eroded with wind or water or whatever. And that depletes our nutrients in our soil. So we're uh, coming up against a really, uh, a really tough issue here of how we need to revitalize our soils to continue our production of food. All right, enough for the depressing and now for the uh, optimistic. The solution to these issues, and I can tell you right now this isn't going to be, I don't have a one and done issue, um, but I will prevent, present you with a, a range of um, different technologies and, and possibilities that uh, can be used and are, in fact, being used at the present moment to um, abate a lot of these environmental, economic problems that we are uh, coming up to with our conventional systems. Integrative design is a great first step to any kind of sustainable building process. And this isn't just for sanitation and sewage and black water remediation. This can be for anything, whether it be for energy or um, building materials or um, operations and maintenance. If you can connect your operations to act as a system, uh, the system as a whole will be more efficient. So using one product to accomplish various goals will make your entire system more efficient and um, we'll cut costs in various ways. I like to refer to this, and this is how I was taught, to refer to something as stacking functions. So if you can give one product or one um, technology the ability to handle various, um, handle various uh, goals, then that is called stacking functions. So again, and this would go along with that, connecting your inputs and your outputs. In a building, we have you know, a lot of inputs, we need energy, we need water, we need, you know, um, ventilation, whatever. But we also have a lot of outputs, and that would be our waste. So in sustainable building and green building, connecting those inputs and outputs is a way to make a building efficient, but also to lessen the need for outside inputs and lessen the, out, lessen the outgoing waste and keeping it contained. All right, so just some information on uh, some toilets that have been coming out. Like I said, a lot of the toilets, the older models, tend to be uh, three to five gallons per flush. And if you can imagine, that is a lot of water. And if you think about how many times you're flushing per day, it's 
really a lot of water. So there have been models that have been coming out more recently than than ever. Um, low flush toilets, those are about 1.6 gallons per flush, so it's considerably less than the 3 to 5 gallons. There are even high efficiency toilets, which are 1.3 gallons per flush, it's moving, moving forward. And dual flush toilets, if you've ever been to Europe, uh, these are widely used there. And they use about 0.8 gallons for a liquid flush, and anywhere from 1 to 1.6 gallons for a solid flush. Um, and as you can imagine, it takes more water to move solids than it does to move liquids. Um, so that is the most recent development in our toilets. But again, in Europe, this is, uh, unfortunately for us, not something new to them. Another toilet technology that's been uh, slowly being introduced to the U.S. is the urine diverting toilets. I don't know if any of you ever heard of these. But basically, the most important thing about this is our urine is actually sterile as it comes out, and feces are actually what con contaminates your toilet water. So if you haven't noticed, our waste is separated within us when it comes out. Uh, it comes out in, in two different areas, <laughs> at, at risk of being too graphic here. And in a urine-diverting toilet, the design takes advantage of our you know, the initial separation and divides our waste within the fixture. So as you can see in this photo, the front bowl here, I can use my little pointer here, um, the front bowl is a urine bowl, and that would collect urine and divert it to a separate tank. And in this particular model, which is the Dibletin, it's a Swedish design, that is actually a waterless uh, bowl, so it almost acts as like a waterless urinal, which I'll get to later, um, but that actually is no water to flush. And then you have your solids bowl, and that would connect up to your septic or sewer or compost system if you wish it to go there, depending on what your local code official allows. Um, but that solids bowl uses a flush to move the water. There are urine diverting toilets that are dry toilets, in which case this part would be open and it would go straight down into a chamber. So some things to consider on a urine diverting toilet. Um, if you are a builder. Um, a venting pipe, you do need to vent a urine line. So like I said, there is a separate line going out of this bowl, um, and that would need to be vented. A one and a half inch pipe is fine. A lot of uh, these urine diverting toilets tend to be European, and in American standards, we generally have floor discharge, which means the pipes go down to the floor. A lot of these are rear discharge, which means they go out, as you can see, back here. So there is a bit of a plumbing uh, differentiation. That's something you would have to explain to your plumber. Uh, there is additional piping that's necessary. Like I said, there's two lines that come out of this. You have your sewer line and your urine line. So there are additional piping requirements. And a lot of times um, there are such things as U-traps, and I'll kind of draw it with this laser. They go like this. They're like a U-shape. And basically that's to prevent any odor. But a lot of times with urine diverting toilets, we try not to have pee traps uh, because urine and water mixing together can cause crystallization and blockage of the pipes. So a lot of urine diverting toilets just have a 45 degree pipe leading out and some sort of a plastic membrane and that is to uh, stop any odors from coming out. So your urine holding tank. Um, this is the urine, it's a, just a, a normal tank. Generally your septic size tank is about 1,000 gallons for a four person home. Um, in a project that they're doing Cape, with Cape Cod, actually, with urine diverting toilets, they are sizing at 500 gallons for their urine tank. But again, this is something that you would have to talk to your local health code official about. Some benefits of uh, urine diverting toilets are your water use and, and abating water pollution. Um, some urine diverting toilets are waterless, which means they have no connection to water. They don't require any sewage connection. So you're not using any water there. If they do use water, such as the Dibletin, um, you only are truly flushing it about once a day if you think about how many times you urinate as opposed to defecate. So um, you're cu cutting your water usage by about 80%. In terms of water pollution, um, most of our nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is in our urine and not so much in our feces. So if you can contain that from going into a septic or sewer or near any sort of waterway, you're helping stop the water pollution. Get back here. 
and you're also reducing your uh, strain on infrastructure. We, as people, give out about 500 liters of urine per year, and there's about 7 billion people in the world, so if you want to do the math, again, uh, you're saving a lot of water from going into waterways. Application of these systems. Um, so urine diverting toilets, and toilets in general, can be used in urban areas, uh, urban versus rural. The only issue that comes here is as long as you have a place to store your urine tank, you'll be fine. If it's in a basement, that's fine. If, it, if you're rural, you can have it be outside. New construction versus renovation. New urine diversion toilets are, are great for new construction because you can design the building to make sure that you have those separate plumbing piping. Um, and the only thing I would say to that is your piper, your plumber needs to pay special attention to your installation manual. Uh, for renovation, it's also doable. Um, again, I mentioned a project in Cape Cod, and all of the urine diverting toilets that they're using there are uh, renovations. So there is additional piping required, and that's going to additional work require additional work and installation. But I can tell you right now, it's not impossible. Commercial versus residential, uh, urine diverting toilets are fine in either. Uh, commercial, the only thing would be resizing your urine tank, and all of your urine lines from each toilet need to be vented. And residential, uh, same thing, it's the sizing of your urine tank, but it's applicable in all of these situations. Okay, waterless urinals. Uh, this is for the men, so ladies, I'm sorry if I'm boring you here, but um, waterless urinals tend to be gravity drained, uh, so the outflow pipes would connect to a sewer or a holding tank, um, but you don't have extra energy that's going to be needed to, you, to move the urine. You have no pipe for water intake, so generally flush urinals, you would have a pipe where you would flush. Waterless urinals, you don't have that. Uh, waterless urinals can attach to your conventional plumbing system, no problem. Generally, they have traps with oil or ammonia, and this varies by the company that you are purchasing your waterless urinals from, and the trap gets filled with a proprietary fluid, um, and that varies depending on your company that you're sourcing from. The urine, th again, this is for uh, the, um, the odor issue, so your urine would sink down through the trap, and your gases cannot rise through the oil. Uh, these traps that are made of ammonia and oil need to be replaced about every three to six months. One last thing to consider, copper piping. Uh, you do not, under any circumstances, use copper piping with waterless urinals. And this is because copper piping can be highly corrosive. And there was a whole um, backfire with waterless urinals actually in Chicago uh, due to this issue alone. Um, so some benefits of uh, waterless urinals, um, you reduce your water use and your sewer costs. You can save, uh, at, a, at a home with four males, you're saving about 6,552 gallons of water, so that would be per four male. You eliminate infrastructure costs to collect and treat sewage. There's no installation, maintenance, or repair on flush valves, handles, sensors, supply piping, because none of that is necessary. And like I said, they are gravity drained, so you have no reason to have a uh, electrical connection on this. Okay, moving on to compost toilets. Just so everybody kind of gets a basic process, composting is pretty simple across the board, whether you're composting your food scraps or you're composting your personal waste, human waste, humanure, as we like to call it. Um, it's all the same. Basically, the first step is a dehydration process. Too much liquid in uh, compost deprives organisms, the bacteria that breaks down the organic matter, uh, deprives them of oxygen, which doesn't allow them to work as, efficient, as efficiently and break down their organic material correctly. This is why oftentimes you hear about or aeration of a compost while turning it, and that is to allow air to get in. In many systems, especially when we're talking about compost toilets, it is important to have a drainage system if it's contained because you are going to need to get rid of that excess, whether it's a urine, uh, liquid, or it's flush water. The next step is a bacteria and fungal breakdown. Uh, bacteria and microorganisms, they practice aerobic digestion. Bacteria is what's most abundant in your compost pile, and they're eating away at that organic matter. 
Actinobacteria breaks down your paper products, so that would be like your paper, your newspaper, or toilet paper. Fungi, molds, and yeast, I'm sure we're all very familiar with that, breaks down lingon-heavy products, which is basically what gives wood its, uh, its uh, stark structure. It's called lingon. Protozoa is another organism that consumes bacteria, consumes fungi, and other microorganisms and particulates. And rotifers are another organism, and they can also control bacteria, protozoans. So in a compost bile, basically we're cultivating an entire living ecosystem that are helping us produce and break down organic matter. And the last would be uh, worms. I'm sure many of us have heard of worm composting. It's starting to get very popular. Popula popular sorry. And the wonderful thing about worms is that they aerate the soil, again, bringing air into and oxygen into the soil. And they ingest partly composted material, which help plants easily absorb uh, all the nutrients. So in compost toilets, we have a variety of different uh, types, self-contained versus centralized, uh, manufacturer versus site-built, flush versus waterless, batch versus continuous, active versus passive. There's various uh, combinations of these. Um, so I'll just go ahead and, and talk a little bit about each of them versus each of them. Self-contained, these are generally drop systems. So a toilet is being hooked up directly to its composting chamber. Many of these systems have a view to their contents, which cannot be so pretty. Um, they're not generally sophisticated, but they do require dry material to be added. Again, it's the water issue. Centralized systems uh, connect several toilets up to a centralized place where it collects and composts human waste. This allows for more design flexibility. Manufacturer versus site built. There are many design companies that manufacture toilets. They can be bought online or in showrooms. They come with manuals. Site built. These are built by a homeowner or a contractor for site specific area. They don't tend, generally tend to be um, sophisticated, but they work just as well. Flush versus waterless. Flush toilets and flush compost toilets require some amount of water to transport your solids. Um, the only issue with flush is that you just have to make sure that either the water gets separated or it is drained. Waterless toilets, they're just drop systems. You don't have to use water. It's gravity, um, and it gets processed and decomposed. Batch versus continuous, a batch system, you put everything in one receptacle and then switch it out and let it rest and use a new receptacle. Continuous is where you're continually adding material to a system. Um, so that's the difference between those. And active versus passive. On active, we're looking at um, something that requires electrical or mechanical turning, uh, either using solar power or you know just energy in general to turn a system. Or passive is just letting it rest and do its own thing naturally. Passive generally takes a little bit longer. Urban versus rural, uh, applicable in both. Um, generally, with urban, more of the issue comes into uh, comes into question with local code, but they there are systems that are applicable to both and are used in both. New construction versus renovation, also applicable in both. If you're doing new construction, um, you know you can create your own system. In renovation, a lot of times going with a prefabricated system that is specific for renovation. Um, is best, and commercial versus residential, as long as you're sizing your receptacles to, you know, your use patterns, then it should be fine, and residential is fine as well. I just also wanted to talk a little bit about some other further alternatives to just touch on lightly. Incinerator toilets are basically toilets that burn up all your waste. Foam flush, use just a little water and biodegradable soap to wash your bin, and those are generally hooked up to compost toilets. You need to use biodegradable soap in these because some soaps can be toxic to bacteria. Uh, vacuum flush toilets, you're probably very familiar with these on airplanes. They use almost no water and they transport weight incredibly quickly, but they do use a certain amount of energy. So if energy is an issue in your design, then um, that may not be the best. Maintenance. All systems in sanitation sewage require maintenance regardless if they're conventional or alternative. Biological systems require a different kind of maintenance. They require evaluation, um, constant checking. Um, they require emptying, so you need to make sure you're maintaining it correctly to allow future uh, material to be deposited because you don't want to build up and then you have nowhere to leave your stuff. And also one more thing to be very um, uh, 
wary, not not wary about, but um, aware is where your final destination of your product is going to go, of your waste is going to go. Uh, urine can be used as fertilizer. Uh, it's, again, heavy in those nutrients, NPK. So it can go into gardens, agricultural fields, land space. Where is your compost material going? Again, it can go to the same place. Talked a little bit about why soil needs that. Um, but there it does need a final destination, and that is also something that you need to check with local code because they have some rules and regulations about what you can do with your humanure. A little bit about gray water use and what you can do with your gray water. Gray water is basically uncontaminated water, uh, which would result from fe fecal uh, contamination. But gray water sources would be your laundry, your sinks, your dishwashers. Rainwater sometimes is considered gray water. And great uses for gray water are irrigation or your toilet flush water, something that is not going to be consumed by humans. The benefits of gray water use are reuse of a valuable resource. Again, uh, there's not a lot of water to go around, and making the most of it is very important. Diminishing your output to your sewer systems and therefore pollution. A lot of dish detergents and soaps and things like that are very heavy in phosphorus, and again, that causes our eutrophication algal bloom problem. So again, containing that water for another use is a great way to diminish pollution, and also it's an economic benefit because you don't have to pay as much to leave stuff into your sewer system. Created wetlands. This is a black water remediation. Uh, it's a great uh, technology that's been coming about in various different ways, um, starting to become more accepted, and uh, I really am fascinated with created wetlands. So basically, created wetlands um, is cleaning water by natural processes, in our earth, we have wetlands that uh, act as buffers to ocean, salt water, um, but also they clean ocean water and clean other water and contaminants uh, in those areas, in, in normal, uh, natural wetlands. Created wetlands are a form of biomimicry, um, and created wetlands also help in reducing our nutrient load. So again, we talked about the heavy nutrient load in our black water. Um, and aquatic plants that are specific for wetlands um, are great in reducing nitrogen and phosphorus. Also, these wetland plants, the oxygen gets pumped by the plants to get into their roots, and microbial decomposers, that bacteria attaches to those aquatic plants, and that's what eats your particulate, particulate your solid organic matter, or, or poop, if you will. Bacteria and fungi break down the particulate matter, uh, and these can be used on a large to small scale. I've seen them from municipalities to uh, just, you know, a building, um, anything in between. So the first and uh, well-known one is the living machine. This is a technology that was modeled after uh, John Todd, a leader in ecological design. It's basically a very intensive system that uses a variety of wetland plants, uh, algae, protozoa, plankton, snails. Basically, it moves through your water. Oops, sorry. Hold on for a moment. Give me one moment. Basically, your water moves from a primary tank to various other tanks that basically allow solids to settle. Uh, they handle your water flow, which in a building can be intense to not intense, heavy loads to low loads. So they monitor the load um, of water that's coming in. And basically, again, it's a uh, these pools, you can see one here, as I'm showing you. This is a, a stage one tidal flow wetland cell, is what it's called. And it's filled with um, different media material, rocks, peat moss, things like that. And those get filled and drained. And it goes through a polishing system where it goes through final treatment. And then the wastewater of these living machines can be used in, again, toilet water and irrigation. Again, that's based on local health codes. Living Machines, there's one in the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission in the Port of Portland headquarters and the Evergreen Western Wayne County Schools. And it's a great educational tool to teach students on how, you know, how this cyclical process works. There are other outdoor created wetlands. Uh, Duke Farms, New Jersey actually has a wastewater wetland that processes 12,000 gallons of water. Um, and basically it's an outdoor system. It's you know, layers of natural materials, and um, this helps to reintroduce water into the groundwater and also to irrigate their nearby meadows. In Humboldt 
uh, County, California, they constructed a giant outdoor wetlands project in 1983 where they transformed thousands of acres into freshwater marshes and things like that. That's more large scale. Um, but generally they go through their sludge pumping process, which is removal of those solids, um, and different treatment marshes to um, to disinfect their, uh, their all their wastewater. It's pretty uh, amazing. There are other technologies also in terms of biofiltration that can be used indoors. They're emerging uh, UV filters. Uh, that is uh, more of a uh, more artificial, but UV light is still a natural thing. That's what comes from our sun. And UV light penetrates the cell wall of an orga organism and destroys the cell's ability to reproduce. This is kind of what happens with our skin when we get sunburned. Um, and so the same thing can be applied to your wastewater. You can kill the bacteria in your water by UV. You just have to have long enough exposure with the UV light, and the water can't be cloudy. Phosphorus traps are another emerging technology. They use polonite, which is a mineral from Poland. Um, that's basically, it's a clay, and it absorbs the nutrient phosphorus. And it can be, once it's saturated, it can be spread as fertilizer, but this also actually reduces bacteria again by 55%, and um, also captures all that nutrient from going into a waterway. Peat moss, uh, which is another wetland product, basically, is another actually very popular filtration media. It's highly porous, so a lot of water can get through it. It's very acidic, so it kills off bacteria. And it hosts a microbiological community, and this allows um, different bacteria to eat up any kind of, uh, you know, coliform bacteria, any dangerous bacteria, and it has polar properties, so the peat itself is negatively charged, if you know anything about the negative-positive relationship, but they're negatively charged particles, so they attract positively charged particles, which would be like ammonium or metals or pesticides or even organic molecules, um, things that we don't want in our water going downstream. Peat is wonderful for, um, for containing that and they remove about 90% of fecal coliform bacteria, which is the bad bacteria that gets let out through our feces, and they can even remove up to 99% of bacteria. Another one is sand filters, and these are actually widely used in, in third world countries, um, but sand filters are just another filtration media. They rid uh, water of particulate matter because it gets caught in those grains of sand. And again, um, this is they host a, a biological community that eats any kind of bad bacteria, they live on the on the surface of the sand, and they eat any kind of nutrients and bacteria that's left in your wastewater. So the benefits of a um, biofiltration or wetland system, whatever you want to call it, one of those systems is that you get to be independent from your sewer system. So again, it's an economic benefit. That's an environmental benefit. Um, you don't have to link up to it because you have an end final resting place for your wastewater and you're also treating your wastewater on site. Natural filtration, you're not using any chemicals that can be dangerous to the environment. You're using all natural materials. Um, so that's another wonderful benefit. Again, you reduce your, your chemical use. And you're creating ecosystems. And, and to me, this is, is a very important one. And in the example that I use in Humboldt, they attracted all this aquatic wildlife and, and bird um, communities and populations to this area specifically by building these ecosystems. So you're cultivating this entire uh, biological community just trying to do one thing, but instead, you know, if you're using a, a, an indoor wetland, you're also doing air filtration. Again, this is a, an example of stacking functions like I talked about before. Another great benefit to uh, created wetlands and biofiltration systems. So a little bit about meeting standards. Um, these kinds of systems will help you gain LEED uh, certification. There's about one, I think it's uh, two to three points that you can get for water conservation, and I believe also two to four points that you can get for innovative design with these technologies. For Living Building Challenge, this would help you gain water and resource pedal credits. Some economics, again, this is kind of a, an example specifically in Ann Arbor of how, how much it costs to pay for water and also pay for sewage outputs. 
But economics of alternative systems can be a little bit cheaper, ranging compost toilets. If you build it yourself, it could be $50. If you're buying an engineered system, it could be 15000 Toilets can range from 100 to 1200 depending on what you're looking for and how uh, sophisticated they are. And maintenance, there's still maintenance costs, especially when it comes to pumping. But if you're dealing with a, a biological system, especially a compost system, mostly you generally need a, a shovel and a bucket, so you don't end up paying very much for the maintenance of those. There are still maintenance costs incurred, but they tend to be lower. And last, I wanted to just spend a minute or two on um, advocacy and awareness, uh, because although it seems like I love to talk about this issue, and I may be the only one, there are actually some other people out there in the world that find this important. So WaterSense is an EPA-sponsored uh, program that um, lists many toilets that are water efficient, again, those low, efficient, low flush, high efficiency toilets, and they actually offer rebates to toilets that are on their list for homeowners. Um, Flush is a Portland-based organization that does advocacy for public sanitation. They're also very interested in environmental sanitation. Um, Carol McReary is the woman that heads that. She's wonderful. And they do a lot of uh, advocacy and education work. Recode is another Portland-based um, program, and they are working to build a building code specifically for urine diverting and composting toilets. So when plumbers and code officials go to look, they at least have a definition of what these systems are and how they can be correctly applied. Uh, it's a great process. It should be out, I believe, next fall. So definitely looking forward to that. The Poop Project is a uh, wonderful man from New York City. His name is Sean Schaefer. He does a lot of advocacy and psychological uh poop-related uh, educational seminars and, and things like that, mostly dealing with the psychology about it and how we can get more comfortable with this issue because it starts with the education. And Rich in Earth Institute is a wonderful nonprofit organization. They are located in Vermont, and they are on their third year of experimentation. They do um, – they basically have volunteers – that donate their urine to the Rich Earth Institute, and Rich Earth Institute collects the urine, they pasteurize it so they heat it to kill any possible bacteria, they also age it, and then they spray it on um, an agricultural field, a hay field, so it's not for human consumption, but um, they allow that and they test the results and they test the soil uh, vitalization and um, they're continuing their studies on this. They've had a lot of success, and uh, they're just another group that's moving towards um, nutrient reclamation and, and closing this cycle of our human bodies and our earth. So that is it, and I want to thank you guys all for listening to uh, this information. I know it's not the most glamorous of topics, but uh, you know, our sustainable building world is, is starting to get mainstream in terms of solar powers and building products, and sanitation is about the last frontier, and it is important as, you know, it can be uncomfortable to talk about, but um, it is a major problem, and there are technologies out there that uh, can abate issues, um, and I am happy to bring them to the forefront. If you would like to contact me for some more information, I would be happy to help you with anything. You can reach me at this email address, atara at rosiesnaturalway.com, or at either of the numbers listed. And actually, I have to correct Brett. I'm actually located in Pittstown, New Jersey, not Pittsburgh. I'm sorry, Brett. Um, New Jersey is where I'm located. So thank you all so much. And uh, I would like to open this up to questions. <laughs> uh, uh, this is uh, Brett here. Yeah, I... Uh you know, I read Pittstown thinking, oh, it's just a slang word of saying Pittsburgh, but then didn't keep reading the state, so. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Yeah. Totally different state, though. Um, totally different. Anyway, we've got, uh, we've got questions uh, here, um, and then uh, certainly for the, uh, we've got some time to um, answer a couple more questions, and so go ahead and put them into the chat box to the left, but 
Here is a very easy and simple one uh, that I'll start out with. Um, so it's just a request if you could name again those facilities, those educational facilities that have some living machines that um, you know of. Sure. Um, let me just run back to my notes here. Living machine. Okay. There is one in the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, Port of Portland headquarters, and that's a really cool one. They have outdoor and indoor. And Evergreen Western Wayne County Schools, um, and they use it as an educational tool. Uh, if you look up Living Machines, you'll it's you know the first thing on Google, and you can click and see their portfolio. Great. We've got another question from uh, Jessica here. Um, do costs increase significantly for urine diverting toilets since you need dual plumb the toilets? Um, and if so, how are these costs offset? Is it potentially in decreased wastewater discharge fees? Right. So generally, uh, urine diverting toilets do tend to be more expensive um, than you know your average Home Depot toilet, and this is because they come with a specific design. They are also a little bit more money to install because you do need the extra urine holding tank and you need the separate piping, although the piping is, is not very expensive, more it comes with the insulation. However, if you are using a, a flush uh, urine diverting toilet like the Dublin that I was um, displaying, then you also have to look at your water usage and your Again, those costs of water input and sewer output, if you're in an urban area, would be offset because you are charging, discharging less and using less water. Great. Thanks, Tara. Um, we had another question come in What uh, uh, from Shannon here. Um, have you had any experience using black water remediation in uh, restaurants? Um, I have not personally. Um, I actually don't know of any restaurant that does, um, and I am going to be daring to assume that that is probably because local code officials are, are probably extremely wary about having black water be so close to food that humans are consuming. But I do not see, um, you know, if you can fight hard enough, um, if you had a system that was a black water remediation system that can you can show a very clear separation of your facility from that system that it would be I couldn't see that being an impossible thing to do again that is something that you would have to wrestle with your local code official over um, as far as I know I do not know of any that are in a restaurant uh, facility but I don't see it as impossible. And if you're using it, you know, for irrigation or toilet water, then um, it shouldn't pose too many risks. But, again, I could say that, but your local code official might think otherwise. So. Yeah, that's great. You know, um, sticking kind of on the, on the code piece here, and, um, you know, it's, just to make a comment, it seems like, you know, yes, Certainly, there are many different um, jurisdictions, um, and they, you know it's always yes. Check with your local cold official. But you know, if I were to say what I get a sense for around the country is that you know, especially in more urban or maybe suburban areas, uh, that the code usually says if there is a a sewer, um, you know, a sewer connection that you must. You must connect to it and and send your waste there through a conventional system. Is that pretty much what you find? Uh, yes, actually, um, we have an Aquatron, which is a uh, a great retrofit compost toilet. It's a it's actually just a compost system. It doesn't connect specifically to a specific toilet. You can hook it up to um, any kind of flush toilet, your inverting toilet, and we have one installed in Brooklyn, if you can believe it. Um, in a uh, living building challenge building in Brooklyn called Bright and Green, and we were able to get that through because as long as we hooked up our wastewater to the sewer, the code official was happy. Um, but we were, they are, they do have the compost chamber in use where they're composting human ore, 
um, and that's working quite well. And we use uh, worm composting with that. So uh, there, that system is in is in the process right now, and they're actually using the worm casings, which is what happens after worms process dirt, um, to be spread on their rooftop garden. So it is possible. Um, it definitely depends on how you phrase it, and generally a, a code official, um, you know, tends to be more worried about the final resting place of the wastewater um, because that's what carries contaminants and water, you know, can spread. So, and I also have to say, you know, I think uh, within the next decade we're going to see a lot of changes. So, you know, I think right now because this issue is so fresh and so new that there is resistance, but I definitely foresee it changing with all the advocacy and awareness that's going on at the moment. Um, I do see it changing in the future with, with you know, um, regulations being a bit more malleable to these uh, new technologies. Um, great, thanks. Uh, in, in, and also related to that uh, question here from um, uh, Morris, uh, do you have a list of any cities uh, that are accepting Blackwater systems or designs or any that you can point to that uh, are pretty friendly to that right now, at, at least in their code? Um, I don't have one in front of me at the moment. I apologize. But mm -hmm. whoever's question that was, if you would like to email me or call me after this is over, I would be happy to get you in touch with that information. Um, you'd be surprised. Even in, in some of the, the towns or states that seem very forward, they can still have very stringent uh, regulations. But I definitely find that actually Michigan is one place that seems to be a bit more lenient uh, with their um, with their the new technologies. Um, I've definitely seen surprisingly, and and it's funny because you know Brett and I connected on this, but um, but de Mich Michigan definitely, and uh, here and there on the West Coast, and and Portland is doing that recode thing. Oh. Portland um, and Oregon in general has pretty stringent. Uh, regulations, but they are moving forward. They are moving towards being more tolerant. Um, and other than that, I would uh, I would need that person to contact me separately, and I could give them a I'm happy to give you a list. Yeah, so go ahead, and uh, I've got um, Tara's information displayed on the screen. So anybody who's got particular questions about resources, um, you know, you can certainly send her an email. Um, you know, there was a, a question here from Kevin on that issue of. If there's any good publications, graphics, I would say infographics on nutrient flows and potential right. synerg um, synergies for point options. And so maybe if you, uh, again, Kevin, if you you know want some of that information, um, Matar could, could send it over your way. And uh, Kevin, I can, I have miles and miles of publications that I've spent you know the last year reading through. So I can, I'd be happy to give you. All of those references, and there's a lot. There's a lot of information out there, a lot, and I'd be happy to point you in the right direction and, and provide you with everything that I have. Hmm. Um, so here's two somewhat related questions from um, again Morris and Melissa. Um, you know, can you uh, please explain um, a little bit more about what happens to the final collected urine captured from the urine diverting tank toilet, and what are some common uses? Um, for urine. Sure, and I'm sorry if I didn't touch on that enough. Um, so generally, uh, urine, like I mentioned, is, is very high in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So with that, it's excellent for gardens and agricultural fields and the land space if you don't want to use it on, you know, your tomatoes or something that you're going to be eating. Um, you can either uh, dilute it um, there is a little bit of controversy over what the dilution rate should be. I hear, you know, one part urine to three part water, or one part urine to ten part water. I think anything in between there would generally be fine. Um, again, the more you dilute it, the less concentrated of nutrients you're going to have. But you can field apply it with a hose if you wish. Um, or there's actually a technology that's very interesting that has been coming out, um, pretty new. There's uh, a manufacturer in Canada that does it and a manufacturer in Belgium, 
and they make a crystal, crystallized urine called struvite. And basically, they infuse urine with magnesium, and it forms a chemical reaction and causes a crystallization. So you can actually just sprinkle it on your dirt by your plants, and uh, that acts as a fertilizer so you're not field applying and spraying urine if that's something that's, you know, not attractive to you. You could, you know, sprinkle it on. Um, and actually, I have a sample of that and have been using it in a garden. And uh, I'm actually documenting those results. I only started about a week ago, so still, still looking for that. But um, but there are a lot of great uses for, for urine, mainly as fertilizer. I don't know so many other uses Do of it, but... Do you need regulatory um, approval to use it? Any of those applications? So, yes, I yes, no. you would really, um, need regulatory approval, and again, that would vary on who you talk to. And um, what you might run into is mm -hmm. making sure. What I have run into is that most code officials want to make sure that it's not going on plants for human consumption. They're fine if it's going on you know, grass or um, flowers or whatever, as long as it's not being used for human consumption, that's fine. And uh, just oh, to uh, add this, oh, sorry, I just wanted to add really quickly, um, in terms of humanor and composting your solid waste, the same application, you would be using it on gardens or fields or lands. Thanks, Itara. Well, we are just about almost five minutes over here, and so I just wanted to real quick um, say thanks for everyone um, for joining us today and asking um, fantastic questions. Um, for those of you who need continuing education, um, we are going to be sending out a little um, uh, uh, survey here uh, at the end of this for those of you signed up through our conventional system. So make sure to just spam if you don't see anything by the end of the day. There's a quick little survey, a little a quiz on there um, to complete the 10-question quiz. If you could fill that out, that'd be fantastic. If you don't see anything come across your way, um, certainly email us at info at alliancecs.org. I put the uh, email address down on the bottom left in the comments section there. Um, certainly email us there and uh, request a certificate as well, and we'll be we'll be glad to help you out. Um, I think we still have a little more time for for questions. And there's one here that uh, came through about peat moss, which I believe you touched on, Atar, and the living machines. And um, and then the question about it, um, uh, yeah, I read, uh, how sustainable is it uh, here from Kathy? I read that it is not rapidly renewable. And is there a better replacement for it? Right. So this is something that I've also looked into because, again, um, Peat moss is generally uh, like roots of um, actual peat moss that are underground. They've been compacted over time. Um, my suggestion for that and where I source my peat moss, there is a, a regulation, um, how do I explain this, like a, an organization that regulates the sustainable harvest of peat moss. And they are highly accredited um, and... I source my peat moss from Acadia Peat Moss, and they have, you know, um, a lot of literature on how they harvest their peat moss to make sure that it is sustainable. Peat moss can be regenerated. It's not, um, you know, something that cannot be regrown or, um, you know, re remanufactured. Um, basically, a lot of these companies that are looking to do sustainable harvest of peat moss um, offset that by um, creating extra wetlands and, and, and making measures to um, revitalize the places that they take from. So in terms of that, uh, I would just make sure that wherever you're sourcing is a responsible company that is being respectful of the environment. Um, so, yeah. Great. Yeah, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to throw them over to the left. Um, you know, one thought I had was thinking about um, uh, plumber certifications or courses or accreditations to install these types of systems or retrofit 
Uh, is there anything that you know of for that? Uh, not in the U.S. I think a lot of these systems are still really new. Um, I believe uh, a lot of times if it's a, a large compo company for composting toilets, uh, they most likely have installers that they use. Um, as far as I know for an, a, you know, a certification, certification, there's nothing that I know of. But, again, many, if not all of these systems, actually all of these systems, I'll stand corrected, come with installation manuals, very detailed installation manuals. So as long as your plumber or installer follows these manual instructions, you will not have issues. The issues come into play when a uh, plumber does it incorrectly. We had an issue with the Dubletton. Um, a plumber installed that U-shaped trap, that P-trap, and said specifically to not install that, and they had all kinds of issues. And then they came back and said, you know, it's failing, it's failing. And we said, did you follow the manual? And they said, nope. We said, follow the manual, and it works perfectly. So it's not so impossible for, you know, your general plumber to install. They just have to make sure that they, you know, follow the instructions as they're written and, uh, you know, ask questions uh, to the manufacturer. Great. Um, and one uh, last thought I had, uh, you had mentioned that the um, on the urine diverting toilets you have some that are water, some that are waterless. Um, so the ones that are waterless, do they follow some of the same uh, issues as a waterless urinal, such as avoiding um, copper piping, such as particular, um, you know, the, 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 the types of oils that you need to use, or is it actually different? Right. So the the urine separate uh, urine diverting toilets that tend to be compost toilets are, they don't generally have those, um, like uh, U-traps or any of the fancier traps. Uh, generally, they just lead into um, a urine holding tank, um, like, you know, the, the same 45 degree instead of a trap, because generally those are not as highly engineered as waterless urinals. Um, because they're more on the simple drop compost system base. So um, with that, I don't believe there are many of those extra, although I would say still with that, no copper piping um, because it is, can be easily corroded. I mean, um, yeah. So I don't know of any that have any kind of fancier traps, as far as I know. Do you usually recommend text for these types of installations? Sorry? Do you usually recommend PEX for these types of installations? Sorry, PEX but I... Piping. I um, PEX piping? Do you usually recommend PEX piping for I, these types of installations? Yes. Sorry, I couldn't understand what you're saying. Yes. Yep. Okay. Great. Well, hey, everybody. Um, uh, we're going to wrap up here. We're about um, 10 minutes over, and I haven't seen any other questions. Um, so just to confirm, um, uh, for those of you who may have joined us a little bit late or want to access this later, we'll have full access to the PowerPoint and be able to rewatch this um, recording, uh, hopefully on our website within a week, usually within a day. I will send out a link to where you can find more information on that. We'll be sending out the, um, the survey and the test as well, so take a look out for that if you're needing your continuing education. And we um, really thank you guys for joining us, and especially a uh, big thanks to Atara and uh, Rosie's Natural Way for um, providing us this information today. Um, thanks again, everybody. Have a good week. Thank you.